Hi, this is David D. Hilser. I am a critical thinker. I am a dissident scientist, and I'm here to tell you the truth about science, something your university professors won't tell you, the mass media won't tell you, and of course, those science evangelists won't tell you. Today, I'm going to continue my talk about assumptions, and the best assumptions listed in on the planet are from this man, one of the great scientists of our time, without a doubt, the best, great, the most important scientific philosopher of our time, Dr. Glenn Borkert. And this is his book, The Scientific Worldview, which came out in 2007 and is absolutely a must for all science teacher, uh, teachers, professors. Uh, they're not going to give it to you. But for critical thinkers like ourselves, maybe 100 years from now, this will be required re reading by almost everybody in science. Right now, it's required by critical thinkers like me and lots of people who believe that assumptions are very important to science. I'm going to read through you his assumptions. He wrote a book called The Ten Assumptions of Science, which are which is in this book. So you get like two books for one. Um, and uh, it, it, he has he has them listed here, and I'll list them in order. And there are ten of them. Of course, the ten assumptions of science: materialism, one; causality, two; uncertainty, three. That's not good. One: materialism. Two: causality. Three: uncertainty. Four: inseparability. Five: conservation. Six, complementar complementarity. Seven, irreversibility. Eight, infinity. Nine, relativism. Ten, interconnection. Ooh, we hear relativism. Does it mean believes in Einstein? Well, you have to sort of believe in Einstein since, since it's not fact and it's so messed up. It's a belief system. It's a religion, Einstein. Okay, that's a different thing. Oh, that's the second law of science. So let's go through these. Some of them are pretty easy to understand. First assumption of science, materialism. The external world exists after an observer does not. So if you believe in spirits and you believe in a place and other things that aren't our material, <coughs> Borker said, nope. Uh, I am also believing this. Um, if there are spirits or whatever, they'd be in material form somewhere. But uh, in my opinion, if that was the case, but this is an assumption of science that the external world exists after re observer does not. I always thought that people are fascinated when you, there's a dead body and people have a chance they're going to go up and look at it. I think part of that curiosity, which is sort of morbid, what we call a morbid curiosity, is like, oh, that person's dead. They're not perceiving I'm going to be there someday, yet the world around us is still going. It certainly is. I'm standing here looking at them and the world didn't end. It's not just because I don't see it anymore. Okay, the second assumption of science, causality. All effects have an infinite number of material causes. That is, everything around us is is a uh, affected by everything else. So all the atoms and everything way down and infinitely down, all the pieces of the pieces of pieces of pieces infinitely down, and all the things above me, around me, all the way out to galaxies and groups of galaxy clusters, all that stuff, it all affects everything. So that's what that means. I believe that, too. The third assumption of science, uncertainty. It is impossible to know everything about anything, but it's always possible to know more about anything. So what does that mean? Our theories and everything we write are going to be okay. They're going to be, you know, sort of well, give us some clues about stuff, but it's not going to be a theory of everything. Uh, the theory of everything is, is really almost impossible to have, but you can have <coughs> lay down building blocks for those kinds of things. But that's what that means. It's impossible to know everything. So like if my brain, if I'm trying to think about and, and understand the circuits in my brain right now, the thought of looking at those in a brain affect the brain itself. And so by the time I think I know about it, it's already changed because I'm thinking that's what it's sort of like. Um, what's the fourth one? When you come up to the one that's always the hardest one. Inseparability. Just as there is no motion without matter, there is no matter without motion. There doesn't exist something that's stop and still. And well, no, it's sitting there. Well, no, because its atoms are moving like mad inside. It's got micro movements. So basically, this is something that's going to take some time for you to understand. By the book, think about it. Oh my gosh, you're going to have to be critical and thinking about this. I'm not going to be able to explain that to you, but even my father, who was really not a Borkian, as I call him, uh, came to that same conclusion. Um, so yes, matter and motion, motion and matter. We're coming up to the one that's hard. That's the hard one to understand. 
the which one did I do? The fourth? Which way? Inseparability. Matter of motion. Yep. Okay. Fifth assumption. Page 67. Matter and motion. Matter and the motion of matter neither can be created or destroyed. Sort of like that law of conservation. It is called conservation. So yes, that one I won't go through too much because that makes a whole lot of sense. The sixth assumption. That one's a little harder, but I can explain to you. It took me a while. Actually, I started this video a bunch of times and I messed up right here. Let's see if I can get through it this time. Um, the sixth assumption, complementarity. All bodies are subject to divergence and convergence from other bodies. This comes down to really simple. The idea that the, the universe is always getting more disorderly, that sort of comes with the Big Bang, so it's things going in one direction, but somehow we see things get ordered, don't we? We see things happen that are chaotic atoms that we eat that get turned into people. So how is that? So the idea is that this goes against the second law of thermodynamics and says, yes, we have ordering and disordering all the time. But this is sort of like the same thing as the not having the Big Bang. You have an infinite universe. But that's infinity. We'll talk about that a little bit. So that's what that one's about. I got through it. Yay! All right. The seventh assumption of science, irreversibility. All processes are irreversible. Sorry, folks. No traveling back in time. Doesn't happen. Never will. We can sit there and pretend. It's really fun because it brings up all these paradoxes. Because uh, think about it. If it really happened... The, word, the universe would be absolute, well, I don't even, it couldn't exist. That's why he says, seven assumption of science, irreversibility. The eighth and the most holy one. Now, I'm your science event. No, I'm not your science evangelist. You have the right to disagree with all this. But I happen to agree with it. The eighth assumption of science, infinity. The universe is infinite, both in microscopic and macroscopic directions. In Glenn Borkert, I know you're going to watch this because I'm going to send you a link to it because here I am singing your praises. And uh, we'll continue to do that until um, people are above me looking down and I'm dead. And the universe will still be there. That's kind of sucky. I won't be here. Oh, well. oh sorry. Off the off, off, top. But, but um, the eighth assumption of science, infinity. The universe is infinity, both microscopic and macroscopic, all the way up and all the way down. What does that mean? There are, part, there are no partless parts. There's atoms, sub subatomic atoms, sub 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 sub, and they said it's turtles all the way down. They say, well, if the turtle is standing, um, if the Earth is standing on the standing on the turtle, what's the turtle standing on? This was a philosophical thing that happened a while back. You can actually look up turtles all the way down, um, on Wikipedia, but I actually I say I added to that it's turtle all the way up, and turtles all the way down. It's infinite turtles standing. It's a stack of infinite turtles. And each turtle is at a higher level. So that's what this means. That, and I believe that too. And that's why you can't have the ultimate particle. Because if you did, the particle has to be magic. And start organizing itself. How does that happen? Don't know. So I've added to the Borkert uh, world. At least I think so. Uh, the ninth assumption of science, relativism. Oh my gosh, Glenn Borkert supports Einstein. <laughs> Wrong. All things have characteristics that make them similar to other things, as well as characteristics, characteristics that make them dissimilar to other things. This is very interesting because that that's, simp that's a, a simple statement. That is, we have things that are similar and other things that are dissimilar. And you know one of the things about infinity and all this? Every particle is different. That means no two electrons are identical. Ever. Never. No particles are ever the same. That's pretty wild to think about that, isn't it? Well, think about it. No sun is the same. No human being is the same. Why would it be different from with some atomic particles? Well, we think they're all exactly the same, then they'd be. No. We have probably an average measurement for those things, if anything. We're getting there. We're on the ninth, so relativism doesn't have anything to do with relativity. And I will tell you, no, if your hopes are up that Glenn Borkert, the, great, the greatest uh, science philosopher of our generation, or maybe a lot of generations, believes that Einstein is correct, sorry to burst your bubble, but he does not. Oh, unless 
he does, and then Glenn will tell me, but no, I don't think he does. The tenth assumption of science, interconnection. All things are interconnected, that is, between any two objects exist other objects that transmit matter and motion. That was, we can't have things happen in movement without something making that movement, uh, take, carrying that. We can't have um, something that happens somewhere without some type of mass and motion. Uh, everything is interconnected. The, the universe portrays a fundamental property of existence, interconnection. Whenever we try to think of any particular thing as unity, we must view it uh, view its parts as being interconnected. So that's the tenth assumption of science. And he goes on. And of course one of the big things he talks about is is the, if you look at it, it's number eight that really lays the groundwork for most of this, and that's infinity. He is Mr. Infinity. In fact, he's writing a new book on infinity. But I will tell you again, I can go on and on and on and on. This is must be read by everybody. It's on Amazon. I think it's in Kindle form, ebook. Buy it, read it, buy it, read it. It'll blow your mind. If it doesn't blow your mind, it's all right, but it should. So thank you, Glenn Borkert, for existing during this time and writing this book and giving us the foundation. Because my dad's particle, my, my, my dad's particle models all based a heck of a lot on this stuff. Although he's an etherist and we're not. But regardless, worth your wild every penny. It'll. My brother, who's not even into physics and stuff, reads this and he loves Borkert. So, and remember what I say, don't take anything on faith. Read it. Read it for yourself. Stay critical. Stay thinking. I am your science therapist. That's why I'm here to tell you. And today I'm telling you about good stuff, not all the ridiculousness of the mass media and the universities, etc. So I hope you enjoy this. Glenn, thank you so much for what you've given science. Great to the world. Ciao for now.